So, um, Kprody <laughs> likes birds, uh, makes cute drawings uh, that he occasionally shares with the Discord server, and even has a SoundCloud where he publishes music composed by him. Uh, now, you would expect somebody that has uh, that many artistic interests to um, not care much about uh, small details in computer science, and yet he has a lot of interest in small details about uh, locking and concurrency, and that's uh, what he's going to talk about today. Um, the, the title is Build a Barging Lock, and uh, Prodi, the stream is yours. So, yep, talk is about building a barging lock. So, down to the introductions. So, my name is King, or Kprodi81 Works. And I have GitHub, where I just post all my unfinished projects. Uh, professionally, I'm a full stack developer. So I do front end, back end, whatever. If anything, with a stack, really. And then for hobby, I just like to optimize stuff. So I mostly do runtime libraries, like anything from texts to uh, allocators to hash maps, whatever. There are two words there that may have been confusing. So lock and barging. We're going to get to barging later. But a lock is effectively, you can think of it conceptually as having ownership of some resource. Like Git is a good example, or a bathroom stall, only one person, ideally only one person can be in there. But like in also in Git, only one person can enter the code. And if you have multiple people in there, it can cause some problems or a certain corruption or anything can happen. So a lock is a way to ensure that only one person is, or one thing is updating something at a given time. And so what they're used in programming is through threads. When I say threads, it doesn't have to be OS threads like most people may know. Could be either um, it goes by different names like coroutines, coroutines, fibers, uh, contexts, tasks, what have you. Anything that runs in parallel to another task. So uh, most systems let you write code that technically, or not technically, but conceptually runs in parallel. So when you have things running in parallel, you need to able to synchronize their memory access. And so that is where atomics come in. So atomics are basically instructions given by the hardware that let you uh, do small little operations that are guaranteed to not uh, be preempted or scheduled or scheduled in between. So they always either complete or don't complete. And most times they just complete. So the top is what they do algorithmically, and then the bottom is some examples of x86 code. So using these atomics, you can build higher level synchronization primitives out of them. And that is where the thread lock comes in. So this is a basic lock for an OS thread. So you try to swap or atomically swap a value to true. And if it returns false, as you can see from here, it returns an old value. But if it returns false, that means a new value must be true. And you were the only, you were the first thread to change it to true. So you return, meaning that you own the lock. So release ownership of the lock, then you set this value back to false. So then another thread can swap it to true and get ownership. It's like a cycle that you spin until you finally able to grab the lock if that makes sense and so now it's time for a demo so i have a branch i'll link the code after the talk but it basically is used to benchmark locks so you use it by running your script here and it lets you customize how much time is spent inside the lock how much time is spent outside the lock and uh, different thread levels for contention. So it's like good to control all these different outputs to see which situations your lock runs uh, best. So I'm going to put here for like 10 nanoseconds, so 100 side, and then 10 to 500. They're like 
it's a randomized range, so it tries to be as realistic as possible. So here is our test and set lock, which is the spin lock we had earlier. Uh, don't worry, I'll explain what the results mean. But well, let's just start with the headers of them. So each time it runs at a different thread level. So how many threads are actually running lock operations? And then the settings we passed in earlier. So this is the name of the lock. And a P thread mutex is the one that comes with the system. So it's going to be our baseline for what is fast, what isn't, and we're trying to get better uh, compared to. So the test and set lock is the spin lock that I explained earlier. And average locks is how many lock operations all threads running formed per second. So this is basically the throughput, and I'll explain what that is later as well. But when you hear performance, you generally think of throughput. So the higher this number, the better. Uh, standard deviation is the variance. So how different amounts of lock operations that each thread complete. So if one thread did 100 locks and another thread did 10 locks, the variance would be higher. And when the variance is higher, it means that one thread is monopolizing all the lock operations. So it's probably should avoid that. So lower is better in here. So as you can see, there's little contention. Uh, the spin lock is re really fast, at least two times faster than the uh, blocking lock provided by the system. Uh, keep in mind that these results are, this is a, this is probably a disclaimer I should have done earlier, but these results are local to my machine, to my OS, my CP combination, and whatever else is running. So if you try to replicate on your system, you might have different results. Something might be faster or something this might not be, but basically a way to show how these core algorithms perform in general. So it gets actually really fast, low amounts of contention. But as we get into the um, the amount of threads per core, because I'm running this on a Ryzen 5 2600, 12 uh, CPU logical threads. So as we get to that limit, it starts to, to grade really, really fast. And that is because every thread that has lock has to spin until it relinquishes this thread quota so another thread can run. So threads that don't have the lock but aren't scheduled, the spin and the one that needs to release lock might have to be scheduled after or before the spinning ones. So it has to wait for all the threads that are running to so spin and realize that they can't be scheduled anymore and then I'll go back in the run queue wait for all of them to come and then that decreases the amount of time spent actually doing lock operations. That's what our throughput decreases. So we need to find a way to mitigate that. In order to improve that, we need to understand how the cache works. So this is a fairly simplified version of the cache where each core talks to each, um, you would call it a layered cache object. And each cache object talks to the RAM. So anytime a core wishes to uh, load or read or write a memory, it has to go through the cache. So let's say you wanted to load this memory. The cache already has it, but it clearly returns it. This is a quick, pretty quick operation. But if it wants to update a memory, it has to make this new value aware of all the other caches. And that requires invalidating the memory. And to invalidate means that all the other caches have to go back to RAM to see the new updated value. So if another thread tries to load X after the invalidation, so well all the way back to RAM, then cache the value and return it back. So this operation in particular is what makes Atomic slow when under contention because Multiple threads storing to the same memory address makes everyone else try to read from memory again. This is what this is the saying that you hear that mutexes are slow. They're not really slow, but mutex contention, where everything is 
refreshing and validating is actually what makes it slow. Oh, let's design a lock to try and mitigate that. This is basically the same as the test and set locked, but instead of immediately um, instead of immediately invalidating, because remember the swap from earlier does a load and a store, always stores and invalidates. But we only invalidate if the load uh, says that the lock is unlocked. So just keep looking at our local cache until someone says, lock is unlocked and then we all try to race to grab it again. It avoids a constant invalidation and only invalidates and the lock is released. So theoretically this should be better on cache. So let's see if that's actually the case. So as you can see here, run the test again. But, uh, this is one of the cases where for my configuration specifically, it's not really much faster than the constant inv uh, invalidation. One reason for this could be just the microcode for how AMD implements it. Another is that cache coherency or the synchronization of the caches is actually faster on modern hardware, but I can't really tell. So this is just one of the cases where the theoretical doesn't really match to the practical for this specific instance. But regardless of that, you can notice that at the higher contention levels, the um, standard deviation is slightly better. Uh, I don't have an explanation for that either. I think this one is random because the results for standard deviation vary randomly based on how much time is spent in the lock, and off the lock, especially for spin locks. So over throughput, which was how many locks there is, and then latency, which is how long it takes for a given lock operation to complete. That was a standard deviation from earlier. But a lower standard deviation, the better the latency. So latency is important where you have one thread that needs to complete something after it locks. It doesn't want to hold or wait on a lock forever while another thread keeps trying to grab it. That would be what we call fairness, and fairness is uh, another property of locks that you try to code for, or one that you balance out because there's no perfect lock balance. You have to generally favor one or the other. Barging, as the title says, is when the lock is unfair. So the thread that acquires it releases it, sees that other threads are still trying to acquire, it can bar in front of them and acquire it again. That um, it can do more lock operations if it's faster than them. The benefit of increasing throughput, but as you can see, other threads have to wait longer, so it's really bad for tail latency. Let's try experimenting with this. Um, the way fairness is implemented is through making a queue of threads who gets the lock and I explain the benefits of it the drawbacks of it and we'll about to see it in action with get locks so this is generally the first type of fair lock that comes to mind when you think of uh, fair mutexes I think it was made famous by the Linux kernel they use it in some places at least as far as I can tell but switch to another lock that I'll cover soon the core algorithm is that uh, get a ticket by incrementing a counter, wait for the owner of the ticket to become the one you uh, incremented. So you can imagine if you have one thread with no contention, increment it, you get back to zero ticket, the owner is already zero, and you continue. Then when you release the lock, you make the owner one, and then you acquire it again, you increment it to one. So it just falls through. If there's two threads, you increment it. Maybe one already, so you have to wait for the owner to become one. The owner becomes one when the ticket zero increments it on the release. So it's like a release back into acquire. That's how it forms a queue of threads based on uh, numerically increasing tickets. So let's see how that performs in the face of 
Get my pensions. You can see that throughput is okay at two threads. Still okay at six threads, but as the uh, contention level increases, the throughput drops dramatically. But to counteract that, the um, standard deviation remains really small. So this lock is generally fairer than most locks uh, that we're testing right at the moment. Just when it means that the um, just don't have to wait as long to get a lock and don't have to wait for someone who's it. So it's all fine, but I'm trying to build barging locks here. So we really care about throughput. But since we're still curious and like optimizing, we can try and get fairness to the absolute minimum just for fun. That's where we use MCS locks. So this is. I mentioned earlier that Linux kernel uses spin locks, but they moved to MCS because it has a few pretty good properties. So how it works is that it creates a linked list of threads. And so each thread um, that releases the lock picks up the next thread to it. What this does is that um, release no longer validates the cache of all the other threads looking at it like in ticket lock but instead invalidates the cache of the specific thread is trying to wake up so you have all these threads spinning on their own memory so they don't have to go into ram until it wakes it up this has the same like uh cache efficient effects as the test the testing set as we explained earlier and so this should theoretically perform better than spin lock uh, or the ticket lock because of the direct cache notification. So, and for the record, the MCS lock commented here actually blocks the thread until uh, instead of spinning. As you can see, even already at lower contention levels, the standard deviation is really low. So it's more fair than a ticket lock is. So it remains and continues to be that way, even when contention levels are high. So if you have some job that's latency sensitive, this would be the ideal lock to go for. But if you have something you care about throughput, it's not that great compared to others. What if we have the best of both worlds? So people thought about it and there's like a general class of locks called hybrid or adaptive locking. So these work is that they try to acquire it by invalidating the cache line really quickly. This is good for if there's no other waiters, so they can just quickly grab the lock and move on instead of having to do the other logic. If there are, if it is already locked, then it tries to spin if there's no waiters already. If there are waiters, then it just goes to sleep like normal. So this has the benefit of the fast require a spin locks when it's uncontented as the also added benefit that it doesn't degrade that fast as spin locks do when multiple threads come in and it's mostly popular uh pthread mutex uses it parking lot uses this scheme and the one that we're going to demo actually based off of the lock found in the going task scheduler so this lock has been tested multiple times. It has the same adaptive approach as earlier, but it's based on, it's Linux only. As we can see, the throughput is competitive with the spin locks, even at lower thread levels. It remains even faster than spin locks at higher thread levels. Also keeping a fairly low standard deviation. This throughput that it displays it consistently has this throughput better, regardless of how many threads we throw at it. So this is like the kind of the best of both worlds. This is generally the locks that are found in the wild, and why using a blocking lock doesn't have to be slower than spin lock. In most cases, it's probably better to go for the blocking lock. You get all the benefits, but with the 
most of the drawbacks. And I say most because faster ways to do spin locks, of course. So the ones I've showed so far are mostly just the naive implementations. There's tons of optimizations. Don't actually use Z spin locks, please. They're bad. Uh, one of the optimizations you can do is back off fielding. The idea is to, every time you fail to acquire a lock, a little bit longer and a little bit longer. What this does is make like an interleaving of how many threads are trying to acquire a lock at the same time to reduce contention. So it's mostly a throughput optimization, meaning that um, it lets other threads acquire the lock faster since there's less contention. It has the unfortunate um, property that have to wait longer and longer, which is really bad for latency. It also uses sketch yield, which has its its, its own issues of undefined or unspecified behavior. But effectively, it yields the current thread, the next thread on the run queue of the current core. Makes sense. So why that's important? Excuse me. Why that's important is that it um, makes it so that for high contention levels, threads just yield back to the next one that needs to release a lock instead of having to spin for its whole quota. And you can see through this optimization, it's some pretty interesting numbers out of it. So here we have our threads going along, being fast, some of them slow properties and then there's and then there's our back flock which has incredible throughput but yeah okay is standard deviation but as you can see throughput remains high so does the standard deviation and that continues to climb even at higher thread counts so it's consistently faster than everything else but trades that off for Every thread not able to hold the lock. So it's basically just monopolizing the lock for a given thread, whoever is fastest. Which is what you want in a barging lock, but not what you want in general purpose. So again, spin locks are not general purpose. Don't use them as such. But the right optimizations, they can achieve really, really fast throughputs if you know your scheduling environment, if you know how to implement them correctly. So, what is charging locks? Uh, I intentionally left a few things out because it's not, they're really big topics that I don't want to go in this talk. Atomic memory ordering. So, how do locks keep memory safe? Because atomics only apply to the single variables. So, you need ways to apply it to whatever it's trying to protect. Um, there's also eventual fairness, it's the concept of try to barge first. But if there's a lock that's been waiting too long, uh, form a queue. So it's like a kind of the hybrid approach, but for solving barging instead of solving uh, scaling. False sharing is the idea that dates to or invalidates from a cache line or a memory region can affect their memory region. So you don't want it to, you want them to be in a cache, but the atomic accesses are making them having to refetch. And then direct yielding is yielding from one thread exactly to another to avoid all the run queue stuff that the scheduler does. So these are all interesting topics, but I left them out because uh, you can do it your research on your own. I'm interested in it that way. So finally, here are the references. Uh, the first link is the link to the GitHub for all the source code in this presentation. As a benchmark, and also includes some other links here. Like, I got the cache visualization from this presentation. A going inspired the hybrid lock. Um, this whole this whole lock thing started with working lot, and wondering if I can make that faster. It's been my big inspiration there. Uh, this article has some interesting thoughts on how the spin locks degrade and the different levels of concurrency going bad. So it's a really interesting read. All of these interesting reads. So go check them out 
And that is how you build a barge and lock. Wow. Thank you very much, King. Uh, let me switch to the Q&A view. Okay. Whoa, that was a nice presentation, man. Yeah, applause. Uh, please, slaps in chat. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was the, so man so just give a bit of context to to the viewers so we've been going back and forth about having uh prati do a presentation for a while now uh, i think we started to talking about it even before the uh the summer break and um oh yeah it was a while now and that was awesome. That was awesome. That was really awesome on many levels. Like the drawings are amazing, King. You always uh, say they're not much, but I think they were pretty good. I have to say good for them. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, there's a there's a bunch of slaps uh, in chat. Like I, I don't know if you have uh, Twitch open. You shouldn't. Uh, but uh, no, I don't. Well, in, in any case, you'll be able to check them out uh, later in, in the VOD. Um, so, yeah, that was amazing. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, enough slaps now. Questions. Uh, and while people think of uh, questions to ask you, let me start with the usual uh, warm-up questions. So, um, Let's start by asking you, uh, how did you get into Zig? How you how did you discover it? Uh, I think you were mentioning during the pre-show that you started with version 0 0.4. So I don't know, uh, what's the context? Um, so I saw Andrew's video on Road to Zig 1.0, like a long time ago. Uh, I didn't really get interested in it from that point, but after playing around and again, dissatisfied with all the weird C stuff and then dissatisfied with Rust not letting me do what I want and plus plus being just the weirder C stumbled on Zig. It seemed like it did it was focused on resource efficiency, which is what I really like or really try to uh, strive for when I write code. So it aligned with a lot of stuff got in the community, uh in Discord, interested in a standard library. Um, the Mutex was my first PR, and then it all like snowballed from there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sorry, I was uh, just letting people know in Discord um, that um, you don't need a Twitch account if you want to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> Road to one point oh radicalized me as well, <laughs> says my knight. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you are in IRC or in um, or in the Discord server, please just write the, your question there. Maybe tag me so that it's easier for me to uh, notice that, and uh, and I'll be happy to relay your question to to King. So no worries. Um, okay, so that's what what brought you here. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got radicalized by Andrew. Um, okay, second question. Uh, do you want me to share your SoundCloud to the people? That's oh, usually... No. no? Okay. That's full of all the weird random stuff that I just happened to generate when I was in a preteen. So, interested in that, sure. But it's not really something generally shareable. Okay. <laughs> then if you want... A, so, then if you want a link to it, you'll have to ask... Um, You'll have to ask uh, King personally. Uh, by the way, um, um, how how would you like if anybody has other questions that they want to ask you? Maybe because they're seeing uh, this as a recording on YouTube. Uh, how would you want them to contact you? Uh, could ask my Discord. Put it here. Let me Let's bring that. Not, but... Let me pull this up. Oh no, your face is covering. Uh, add a couple of new lines. Thank you. Okay, Roddy. One, two, four, six. Okay. Um, so, questions. Okay, so we have a question. Yeah, uh, you explain nicely why you want both low latency and high throughput. Are there other dimensions that you might want to optimize for? 
Um, those are the main two. Other one is the size of the mutex. That's not really one considered by many, but it's kind of important, especially when, if you want to embed your mutex in like their different structures. So one of the good implementations of this is WebKit's parking lot. What they do is have the mutex state inside just a single byte. There's actually two bits. And what they do is map the address of it to the uh, to the shared list or queue of threads, similar to how futex works internally. So you can have mutexes that are the size of like a byte, and they fit in, in small JS objects. And so that's one of the optimizations you might consider in trying to make mutexes. Um, besides that, uh, oh, cancellation is also a big one. Like being able to say, I want to lock only for three seconds and then give up. That requires a completely different architecture than bridging. So you have to be able to support adding a thread in and then removing a thread out at any point in time and all the interleavings between all of that. So different ways you can optimize mutex, different features you can add of it. But barging is kind of the most common. Um, OK, we have another question from uh, Discord. Uh, so the, the question for you is, can you do a presentation about hazard pointers? Hazard. Hazard. Oh. Yeah, hazard pointers, uh, that's more of memory reclamation. And I guess it is memory synchronization. It's just not blocking. I can do that for a future talk, but cover atomic memory orderings first before I do memory reclamation too deep into that yet. OK. Um, oh, there's another question. This one is from Andrew. Um, any tips or suggestions or general guidance for the standard library, uh, for the event loop in the Zig standard library? <laughs> Uh, reduce contention. <laughs> now everything is going through, I think, the same epoll view, which has basically has a spin lock underneath. Every time you submit a task from any thread, it has to lock the spin lock. And you saw how well that scales. <laughs> so reducing um, contention by either doing work stealing or basically distributing tasks to threads that so they don't have to look to other threads as often. That's basically how Zap got fast or how going is fast. OK. Um, let's see. Let's give maybe a few more seconds if there's any other question. Let me double check Discord and IRC. Uh -huh, I think we are good. King, do you have Anything else that you want to say to the public before we move to the break? Uh, you can check out the source code for all of this. I really like this mutex benchmark. I haven't found oh. really any other tool that does it. So I like to play around with blocks, go there, do your own locking algorithms, see how all of their form. We submit a PR because I'd like to see them too. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, um, if you can share with me uh, some of the links uh, later, I'll be able to put them in the YouTube description for the recording of this presentation, which I think uh, would be nice. All right. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, thank you very much, King. That was an awesome presentation. As usual, um, you, your art is pretty nice. I think everybody loved it. So uh, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to have you do a second talk then. Uh, we can chat about this later. 